Crouch. Bind. Set. Joe presents the House of Rugby together with Guinness. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of House of Rugby. This is one of your House of Rugby shorts, brought to you by Joe, together with our very good friends at Guinness. I hope you're uh, surviving this week. The lockdown looks like it's going on and on, and um, the joy of that is that we're going to keep bringing you House of Rugby as we do. Um, House of Rugby shorts, as I'm sure you're beginning to know by now, is no hask, no tins. It's exactly what it says on the tin. An interesting guest each week during the lockdown to help us all get through it a little bit more easily. And if you're new to the format, we just do 20 minutes or so with straight rugby chat. And that does afford us the opportunity even to speak to people like our guests today. Now, Chris Keogh is the chairman of Harborn Rugby Club in Birmingham, and they play at level seven of the game in the mid Northwest three. Chris, it's a ridiculous question given everything that's going on right now, but how are you? How is life? Uh, I'm very well. Thank you, Alex. Um, uh, life is interesting, different. I'm not sure, uh, you know, I can stand much more being locked inside, but we know the reasons why we need to do it. So we've got to support it. But um, I think uh, another three weeks we might be going a bit stir crazy, but um, stay strong as you do. You're wearing the Harborn kit. Always good to see Stash on House of Rugby. Talk us through yes, the, uh, colors, the emblem, etc. Yeah, black, uh, black, green, and red. Um, yeah, those are our standard colours. Um, we've got a sponsor in here. I'll give him a bit of a shout out as well. Thousand Eyes. Um, I think it's a bit of IT security company, which is obviously important at this time with everyone working from home. It's been running for about twenty five years now. Actually, it was our twenty fifth anniversary um, this year. We're supposed to have a very big end of season dinner um, in two weeks time, but needless to say, that is. That is cancelled for now. Yeah. Um, let's see if we can kick off the beginning of next year with one. Fingers crossed all being well, we'll get back out in September time. Fingers crossed. So obviously, we sit each week, um, we talk around the fringes of um, of the grassroots game, but we, we focus on House of Rugby a bit more at the sort of the elite end. Um, but there are huge issues, as we all know, and we're beginning to read about more and more happening at the grassroots level, um, where you obviously occupy um, a huge amount of your time. I am very aware that actually what we're going to talk about today affects not only you, but it will affect a lot of people, particularly those in the Facebook group. I know producer Sai has been in there and I had a look at some of the comments and the um, some of the discussions that were going on there at the moment. Um, hundreds and hundreds of responses on what could be done to save the game at this point in time. And I imagine it is a very, very worrying scenario, not not just for yourselves, but for, for clubs up and down the country right now. Um, before we get into the detail, t- tell us a bit more about Harborn. You mentioned it was met, built, sort of founded 25 years ago. How did the club come about? What, what's the sort of the brief history and, and where are you today as a club? Or where were you pre-COVID as a club? We formed 25 years ago um, in a pub about um, a half a mile from from where I am at the moment in Harborn. Um, it was Green Man and it was a combination of a couple of previous rugby clubs, um, GKN, which is a local sort of um, metal bashing uh, factory in, in these parts of a strong rugby club. I think they they uh, disbanded and had, had been gone for about a year or so, but then some of the lads got together in a pub 25 years ago and said, look, we should um, put Harborn Rugby Club together. And um, within two weeks, I think they were fielding five teams um, off the off the back of, uh, you know, five lads having a beer. So it was quite, quite remarkable. We've so meandered along around about the the level that we are. Um, you know, it'd be be nice to go a bit higher, but um, I think that there's no great aspect. You know, we we don't quite want to do an extra. You know, we've got no no plans to quarterfinals of the Champion Cup in the ten years time. So um, we're quite comfortable where we are. Um, but there's a great standard of player um, that we that we've got here, um, and you know we're, we're lucky and, and privileged to be able to keep hold of them. And I think that's. Uh, testament not just to the players themselves but also to the people that have built and bred the club over the last 25 years as of where we are pre-covid we were running two teams regularly but in that intervening um 10-year period we fluctuated between running one team regularly and running running three teams regularly and i think that's to do with um player recruitment player retention um, obviously, the 2015 World Cup, there was great legacy plans for after that. Um, unfortunately, there was a bit of a stumble on the pitch, which I think probably played into that not being as successful as you might have liked it to be. Um, How big an impact do you think that had on you as a club? I, I, I think it had a reasonable, uh, reasonably large impact on us as a club, to be honest. We were running, I think it was three teams uh, prior to that. We'd, we just had uh, just had a promotion and we were you know, really looking to drive our way um, you know, up, up the next 
up and into the next league and possibly the league league beyond that. But then with the World Cup on the course on your on your Saturdays, and this happens every year, right? Um, with the Autumn Internationals and the and the Six Nations, the people that um, want to be going to Twickenham to watch the games, the people that want to be in the pub at 3 p.m. drinking their Guinness and watching the games are being asked to go out onto the pitch at three o'clock and compete in their in their club games. All three can't win. And what we tend to find is that during those Autumn International and World Cup and Six Nations periods, you have a definite drop-off in the number of players that are available to play at the weekend. If they've not played for three or four weeks and then England have had a pretty crap World Cup, and there's still another few weekends to go on with some some good games with the Australia, New Zealand and the like playing. Is there an inclination to come back when it's wet and it's cold and it's miserable and England have been a bit bit shit? You know, where's the inclination to do that? I think it did did affect people's desire to come to come back more quickly. Um, and there wasn't that absolute buzz um, about, you know, England got to the, the semi-finals or to the final or won the World Cup as there were a lot of commentators predicting that we could have done prior to it. So there's quite a sour feeling, I think, around the game, a bit of, just a bit down about it, which wasn't the legacy that we were looking for. Tell me a little bit about, I suppose, the ratio of players that you have relative to the number of teams you put out. I mean, when you had five teams 25 years ago, did you have 100, I'm sorry, I can't even do the math, but 150 players from which to pick? Or are you, uh, you know, do, do the numbers go up and down dramatically or are you are you sort of keeping the same number of players but getting less from them, if you know what I mean? Yeah, so actually if you look at, um, going a bit more more macro than just in on Harbon at the moment, there is a lot of discussion around um, recruitment and, and retention of players um, within the grassroots game. And there's a lot of people saying that, you know, there's just not the players there that they used to be and they're struggling to put out teams. Uh, struggling to put out teams, um, you know, that at the lower levels of the club, I completely agree with. But at the uh, macro level, there's still the same sort of numbers of players available. They're just playing much less regularly. So I think when you look back in the day, 25 years ago, Saturday was a rugby day, and you know that was um, the lads day every week, and they religiously went and played, um, you know, 30 weekends on the bounce or whatever it may be. But then, you know, in, in this day and age, we've got a playing pool of probably 70, 75 players and we can and we're putting out two teams and we're, we're fluctuating between having uh, about 50 lads available um, on a given weekend. Um, and, you know, a couple of those won't be able to get a game because the numbers are subs and, and what have you. But then the following weekend, we may only have 25 available. So that means, you know, we've got 18 for the first team and then there's seven for the for the twos and there's no kind of rhyme or reason to it other than the fact that, you know, I don't think um, everybody commits to every single weekend of playing rugby. I think we've got a core 20 or 25 players. And I think you find the same way at every rugby club that you go to, there is a core of players that will religiously give up their, their Saturday every week for 30 weeks to play the game. But then there's others that will, they'll play one and two, one and three, one in four weekends, which is fine. I, I want those players at the club. It's fantastic because it means they're still engaged with the clubs. It just means that there's a little bit more uncertainty on our part as to uh, how regularly we're able to put out a team. So tell me about where you find yourself now as a club. You know, uh, everyone is, is pausing on everything. What does that mean to you, sponsors, players, et cetera? How are you trying to manage your way through this? We are quite uh, lucky in one respect um, in that we, you know, we don't have a clubhouse. Um, we've got a pitch to maintain. We've got rent to pay. Um, and we've got utilities. That is um, about the extent of our outgoings as a club. A lot of the guys at the club would tell me that not having a clubhouse is not a positive, but in this instance, I think it is. Um, we have been You were working... right all along, Chef. Yeah. You were right all along. <laughs> we've been working for four years to try and get a social space um, through whatever funding we could we could get our hands on some money, which um, you know the founding fathers had put in the, uh, the bank for a rainy day. Uh, which I actually see as a, a club growth fund uh, rather than a rainy day fund. But for now, we might need to dip into that. Um, the the concern for me is around sort of the the lack of certainty, which we all have in our lives at the moment. When are we going back to work? When is the rugby season going to start? We're obviously lucky uh, from our side with our with our members who are, are generally 
generous in what they do and understand and love the club. And so, you know, there's people won't be stopping their monthly um, sort of payments into the uh, monthly subs that they pay at the moment um, because we're not playing. They understand that we need that money to go into the club. A lot of players pay them up front um, at the beginning of the season as a lump sum rather than monthly, which is a knock on effect, which potentially could be an issue for us this year. You know, when, when does the season start? Is it August? Is it September? Is it October? Is it November? And no, nobody knows at this stage. Similarly with sponsorship, um, sponsorship for clubs at grassroots levels, um, I, I tend to find is from your local businesses rather than your big um, national businesses. Harborn as an area is food and beverage and retail led, um, none of which are doing particularly well out of this crisis um, at the moment. Having said all of that though, um, I had a, had a very good call last week um, with Scott Sturdy, who's um, the local rugby development officer for Area 5, which is basically the Midlands. Um, and he was spending 10 minutes on the phone to me and every other club in the region, talking them through all the different types of grant funding um, that is available, uh, both on a government basis, uh, from a Sport England basis, uh, from an RFU-funded um, pot. Obviously, if you fit the criteria, um, you know, you, you're potentially looking at a grants of up to £40,000 over a three- to six-month period, which will just enable you to keep the lights on during this uncertain period. Um, and they're grants. You know, then These aren't loans. You're not saddling the club with debt over the future. So these are there to, to make sure that clubs are alive and that there's something for us all to come back to in you know three, six months' time. So the rugby development officer you mentioned there, is, is that's an RFU employee, is it? Is that that's someone affiliated? Correct. Yeah, that's yeah, correct. So uh, the question I was going to ask you is, is what sort of direction you've had? By the sound of you, you've had some, some quite useful information there. How, how much have you been able to tap into the advice that they've been given? And, and have you put in applications for the grants, et cetera, and business interruption loans and all that kind of thing? There's obviously various bits of different criteria around these, like you said, the business interruption loan, um, and some of it are very specific in what you can apply to and, and can't apply to. Um, we are just refining what we're going to be applying for at the moment. We will be certainly applying for uh, probably in the region of you know seven and a half to, to ten thousand pounds, which will help cover the most recent instalment of rent which I've had to pay, the next instalment of rent which comes due in September. Of course, it's the summertime now, so our pitch maintenance goes through the roof because we've got to get the lawn, um, the I call it a lawn, got to get the pitch <laughs> mown every two weeks, um, which, which Mil costs Military us stripes, I hope, military oh, stripes. Absolutely, absolutely. I'd expect nothing less. All those costs um, are still there. They need covering. Um, our income hasn't been affected horrifically, um, but we had just reached an agreement with a rugby league club um, to basically allow them to use our facility during the summer months. Um, of course, that income won't be coming in now as well. Um, yep. So we, we are hit a bit, but like I said, um, Scott's given us all, all this great, great input that's available from you know from the various um, bodies that every club should be able to um, tap into in some way, shape, or form. That is interesting. So would, would you therefore you'd give the RFU a, a thumbs up in, in this? I mean, I, I have huge sympathy for them because I think it's an incredibly difficult job. The RFU is a, a not-for-profit organisation that tends to take a bit of a bashing from, from everybody. Are you are you frustrated by what the direction I suppose you've had or, or would you actually say that in times of unprecedented crisis they are doing what they can to the best of their ability? I think they're doing what they can to the best of their ability and I know I can I can hear the, the feathers being rustled at the moment by a lot of the, uh, the people that will be listening to this but I think, and this was certainly my view, three years ago is nobody was aware of the money that was available to them. And a lot of these um, these grants, they're not new grants off the back of COVID. Some of them have been topped up or there are a couple of new ones, but they are there and have been there to, to help clubs help them grow themselves. But the communication of of them was rather poor. No one knew what, knew what was available, knew where to find it, knew who to ask. Um, and I think it's great that, um, you know, Scott as part of Area 5, they've called around every single club um, to tell them this is it. And then they followed it up with an email with links to the pages that you need to go to, some help on, on the applications and all that kind of stuff. So from that, I'd certainly give them a thumbs up. And I think it's a tough year for the RFU. First, it's it's a World Cup year. So extra money goes into, uh, into the men's senior team. We haven't got autumn internationals. I think we've had one less game at Twickenham this year. Um, yeah, we've had two in the Six Nations, not three. So that makes it difficult. Yeah. There won't be a summer um, international, but I'm 
Exactly right. So, you know, that they're not getting the money in uh, where they need it to be. And so it's kind of, they'll be feeling the pinch, which means we will then feel the pinch because there will be less less cash available down into, into grassroots. So all, all levels of the game, actually, uh, not just grassroots. But um, from what I've seen from our RDO, you know, it's, it's job well done so far. And I just hope that people take take the opportunity to have a look at those those grants. That's very good advice. Do you know of other clubs that are struggling in a way? I mean, it sounds like you're sort of across it and and you're you're finding a way through it. I just wondered if you'd heard of other clubs in your area who are right up against it at, at this point in time. I've seen a few GoFundMe pages set up for, for local clubs. Um, whether or not they are aware of these grants, some of those are even at the higher level, um, you know, levels six, you know, six, uh, you know four, five, six. Um, so above where we are, who are struggling, um, there are clubs which we play against at our level that have huge mini and junior setups and cult setups, and their first team play at exactly the same league level that we have. But they operate, you know, they, they've got six or seven pitches they need uh, maintaining. They've got a clubhouse that needs maintaining. They will have um, additional overheads and, and all the rest of it. And there's just not that money coming back into back into the club anymore, um, which which you would have had for you know, for the remainder of the season and when pre-season kicks off again and there's summer camps that they'll run which aren't happening now and all that kind of stuff. So whilst I haven't heard any horror stories just yet, the signs I don't think are looking great for, for some clubs. Um, so I think, yeah, look, in terms of putting a group together, let's all, let's all band together and keep as many clubs afloat as we, as we possibly can. I suppose sort of to broaden it out beyond COVID and sort of before COVID and hopefully after COVID as well. What are, I mean, it's not just COVID that has, that has presented challenges for, for grassroots rugby. It's been a, a topic that has been sort of growing in, in noise around it for, for quite some time. Can you just sort of give me a snapshot, I suppose, of some of the challenges that you have seen for a small but thriving club? To, to make the progress you're trying to make? I mean, you've, you've mentioned that in some ways society means that people don't devote their 30 odd weekends a year to their rugby club anymore. Yeah. You know, what are the other things that, that are the challenges that you have to face and try and fi- find solutions to? As you'll have seen from the you know couple of hundred comments on the Facebook group um, over the last 24 hours, uh, which I trawled through, you'll be pleased to know, in absolute detail and read every single one of them. Uh, yeah. And I agree with most of those that uh, that came came through. Refereeing at lower levels, and now this is not a fault of anybody whatsoever, um, but the number of referees we have is is dwindling. There's a lot of knock-on effects of that in that, you know, we, we can get uh, to a position where we're able to put out two teams. Like I said, we can fluctuate between 50 players available and 25 players available. We can get to one of those, and we've had it a couple of times this year, where we've put out a second team, which in years gone by, we would have very happily called our first team. Um, and then there's not been a referee available and the game's been called off on a Saturday morning. Um, because obviously they prioritise the higher levels, and rightly so. That's one thing that we're finding an issue with, and I think that is across across the country, not just around the Midlands. I know that the the RFU have put in a, a young match officials initiative, which is aimed at 14 to 20 year olds, mm-hmm. just trying to get them in, into the game nice and early, which is which is fantastic. And we've seen some of the guys, um, you know, running the line earlier on in the year, just being mentored by the. Um, the guy on the pitch, which is which is fantastic, but it will take a couple of years before we start seeing the fruits of that labour and him coming up and being able to to referee between levels, you know, six and six and ten. Um, so we've still got that referee challenge. I'm going to ask a really ignorant question here, but I, it, it's been a while since I laced up my boots. But played when I played at university, each team had to provide a referee from within their ranks. There was always someone who was injured and you know carrying an arm knock or something, but could still run around and referee a game. At the level you're at, why is that not a solution whereby, you know, if, if you've got 70 odd players to pick from, but one or two perhaps are happy to run around and, and referee a game so it can go ahead. Why is that not an option? Stick them on a course uh, for a week, put them through a two hour training program and say, right, bro, off you go. Uh, I completely agree with you. We've got a qualified ref um, in our ranks who has stepped up a couple of times. Um, we have also had lads um from the opposition step up and fill in and referee um of course you know there's whilst they're happy to referee to make sure that um you know 30 35 lads get a game they're not refereeing um through their own choice and you know they'd much rather be playing themselves and you know um of course you get them a few few beers in the bar afterwards and all the thanks but i think historically 
we've lost referees due to the uh, sometimes verging on abuse that they get on a rugby pitch. Um, really? I, I'm not. I'm, I'm not talking. I'm not talking. Uh, you know, football style abuse here, but it's. Um, you know, rugby is a passionate game, a physical game, and um, the laws are more open to interpretation, shall we say, on in rugby than in football, and not everybody agrees with them. Um, and so there is more uh, debate potentially around um, the the quality of the refereeing, and you know, they they let's remember they're giving up their Saturday to make sure that we get a game, and yeah. sometimes them to be abused, and I, I have seen it when in these instances where, where our lad or another lad has stepped in one, you know, that they, they've copped, you know, a bit of back chat um, and all that kind of stuff when actually they are the biggest facilitators of rugby uh, at grassroots level, you know, without them as, as has been proven. And I've said it earlier on, we can't have a game with no referee. Obviously refereeing is one issue and, and no one likes to, to bag a ref. And I think, I think there is, there is more and more attention being drawn to that issue at the moment. So, I mean, I hope, I hope there is a resolution there. I, I just want to quickly finish with two quick questions. Um, there was an interesting point raised around how amateur is amateur rugby. And Chad Southam uh, put in the Facebook group, an awful lot of teams are buying their divisions when in actual fact there's minimal financial gain considering the, the, the league they're playing in. Surely teams are just chucking money down the drain for low-level silverware, question mark. Is, is that a problem, boot money, buying players into teams from, from other teams, etc.? How big an issue is that in the world that you're living in? It's certainly a gripe which has been around at our level for, for a number of years now. We've benefited from it, actually. Um, you know, the, we, a few years ago, we had three lads join us from another club um, who'd been there for, they've been there for 10 years, you know, and this club was was paying players to come into the club. Um, and these guys had the absolute gall to ask to be paid some money, having been there for 10 years. And they were told no, um, which is fine because they came and joined us. And, you know, they're, they're the um, bedrock of our of our first team now. So we're happy to take that that on board. Yeah, there, there is monitoring, which which does go on. Um, you know, you are allowed under level six. You can you've got a 10 grand budget if you wanted to have a player coach um you, you, you have you know that's absolutely fine six down and under is supposed to be amateur which is why i make that point that it's level six um but that person has got to be a player coach anywhere under that you can actually pay anybody as much or as little as you want um as long as you declare it uh, and if you declare it um in the necessary form which you send off to the rfu that's fine. You just don't, those grants, which we spoke about earlier on, you don't get any financial support because it's basically deemed, you know, if you're paying players, then you should be financially viable enough to be doing that. Therefore you don't need the support um, from, you know, the bodies to, to do that. Um, and if you don't pay players and we, we sign up to, I, I absolutely point blank refuse to pay players. You know, that's not why we're playing the game at our level. It's amateur, um, amateur for a reason. You should be doing it for the crack um, with the lads at the weekend, a few beers, um, thereafter in the camaraderie and everything else that goes with rugby. I do think there are teams that throw money at the situation. And I, 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 personally, I don't understand why. I, I made a flippant comment earlier about not expecting to be in the Champions Cup quarterfinal in 10 years' time. I, I'm, I'm not quite sure what these guys are. I love the ambition that they want to go up the leagues, but there's only so far you can go, uh, I think, um, or, you know, so many clubs can go. Um, yeah. what, what, are you, what are they getting out of paying those players if that is the only way that they're able to keep those players you know maybe, maybe have a look at the offering that you're providing those players in the first place if you have to pay them to be there um at yep. this level um I, I you know i'm i'm dead against it um and everybody in our club knows our views i will never pay a player interesting but, i'm sure there'll be many people who will nod in agreement and there'll be some who perhaps shift a little bit more uncomfortably in their seats but that is the nature <laughs> of the game i suppose at this point in time so the final question, I'm going to lend you my fairy wand and I'm going to give you the opportunity to solve some ills. Um, you know, what, what magic would you love to conjure for grassroots rugby if, if you could right now? What are, the, what are the real issues you think need solving? Proper communication and funding from the RFU. Um, they're, like I said, they're, they're doing well at the moment, but I think this is highlighted as a reflection off the back of COVID, not as, a, uh, you know, not, not as the standard... Then just help around recruitment and retention. How, how, you know, I know they talk to us, 
um, and they give us ideas about how to do this, but I can't force people to play rugby at a weekend because they've signed up and they, they, they've paid their subs. So anything that um, they are, if you're able to do, and I'm not saying it's definitely up, up for them to, to deal with, but anything that they can do to assist in uh, making rugby more regularly accessible um, to people. You know, Saturdays, people have families and that's obviously more and more, um, you know, people are more committed to that perhaps these days. So anything they can do to um, allow rugby and the two to live, to live in tandem for everybody. One final point actually, which we, which we haven't touched on and a um, bit of a bombshell to probably finish on is just around mental health. Um, obviously there's a lot of chat in the professional game at the moment um, around mental health. And I say a lot of chat um, that's comparative to what it was probably 12 months ago. You know, there's three or four players coming out and really being quite open and honest, which is fantastic to to see. But mental health uh, in rugby isn't confined to the, you know, to the top top level of the game. You know, it runs all the way down through the grassroots. And, you know, there's certainly players at our club that I know that suffered. I've suffered personally, and I was quite lucky that a coach that we had um, last year, he's been very vocal about his own struggles, and I was able to go and have a chat with him. I could be wrong, but I don't think all clubs are as, as open um, and people would have the desire to want to go and um, air all the darkness that is going on in their minds. Um, so more help down at a grassroots level. Um, I understand, again, from speaking to Scott this morning, that there was an initiative um, in the North Mid for something to be bought out Q4 this year. Of course, that's that's a bit more on the back burner now, but it's, it's allowing um, mental health to become more of, something that's more spoken about down at rugby clubs. You know, there's not this um, macho bravado that, um, you know, are going to smash people up and have 10 pints. That means I'm absolutely fine. A lot of people are, uh, are not great inside. And so more support for them, I think. It's a very interesting point on which to finish. And I imagine there'll be some who are missing their rugby and their training and everything in particular. I mean, we've, we've spoken in the past on the show about how important exercise is. So I, I hope your players are on... I don't know if they're on off season yet or whatever it might be, but I hope you're, hope you're keeping them fit in the garden. There's so many challenges going around right now, but um, you know, hopefully there is a, a chance for them all to stay engaged. Um, Chris, you've raised some really interesting points. I'm, I'm conscious that the time is tight. Um, this is always meant to be a house of rugby short, but we've, we've got quite stuck into some, some meaty topics. Um, it just sort of, I suppose remains for me to say that you know, obviously the very best to you and, and your, your club and, and your team and um, your, your players, etc. I hope we will find some solutions to some of the problems and the issues that you're facing. And I'm sure there'll be many suggestions left, hopefully politely in the YouTube uh, comments um, so. and below. Thank you very no much indeed. The best for your, your endeavours. Um, that is it for this week. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening to House of Rugby Shorts. As always, we're a podcast and a YouTube show. Uh, and that is where you will find this week's main episode as well with the wonderful, the inspirational Matt Hampson, who was on incredibly good form, talking uh, about his life, giving out a fair amount of abuse to Haskell and obviously talking about his injury, his recovery and the remarkable work that's been done by his uh, foundation as well, the Get Busy Living Rehab Centre. Um, don't forget you can dip into our entire back catalogue if you're looking for something to fill the time at the moment. Uh, we've got a very popular Facebook group. Please be nice to each other in there as well. Uh, there's our Instagram page, which is at Rugby Joe as well. You can now find us on Twitter which is at Rugby Joe UK. Uh, thank you once again to Chris. Look after yourself, look after your club. We'll be back next Wednesday when Hask and Tins reveal their plans for the future of the professional game. God help us all. Till then, have a great weekend. Look after yourselves at home. Be safe and we'll speak to you soon. You've been watching the House of Rugby on Joe together with Guinness. Drink responsibly. Visit drinkaware.co.uk for the facts.